me that. So come Thursday to Christie's <laughs> We're gonna st storm and the bid on field. the letter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the lowest bid is 400000 So wow, that's you could just... Bid. We'll pass around a hat. Just, yeah, yeah pass around a hat. <laughs> Okay, so we'll wrap this up with, um, I, again, I wanted to do, it's a funny, crazy thing. I wanted to do, a, so cast members, get ready, your cue is coming. Um, when I was in, I was out in Lowell last year for the Lowell Celebrates Kerouac, which I highly recommend. Yes. Anybody who's into this, yes. go to that. I mean, it's because it's this little mill town that's very much a little town. And <laughs> all of a sudden, like hundreds of Kerouac people come to town and take it over. Yeah. And it's just great. And so everybody you meet on the sidewalks and the cafes and the bars, everybody's there for Jack. And so it's really fun. So I was there last year, and as usual, hadn't prepared anything. And uh, and I was like, oh shit, um, because this book is about a lot of adventure stuff, and everything, but, but there wasn't really like a tribute to Jack. I was like, oh, well, I gotta, because it's Jack's town, I gotta do a Jack thing, right? So I figured out this part in the book that's actually a recorded conversation between myself and a professor and a couple of other people who were attending the conference all talking about Jack, and it was like, perfect. So I did that there. And then I was coming here and I realized this has also got like the, about the most New York content of any part of the book. And I was like, man, I'm really glad I wrote that chapter. <laughs> because it was like, it was the one for there and the one for here. So this will be a uh, sort of theatrical dramatization or stage reading, I think they would call it, uh, of uh, this passage that happened in Boulder. Hey, Walter, you're the opening. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, there, just talk out here. Okay, well, there we go. Right, wherever we are. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, come on, Jamie, you come over here. Okay, yeah. You go over there. Oh, yeah, we need the couple together. We've got to block this down. Yes, we're together. Oh, sorry, Jamie. Okay, waiting for the start. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is um this is where um after the um John Clellan Holmes did this workshop, writing workshop, and my mind is blown and uh I go for a walk in the park to kinda of let it sink in and um along comes this professor. Ah. And this was my <laughs> professor in NYU. And uh and uh, and then this other couple. And uh, so, so why the hell should I just read the whole thing? Let's uh, let's you know bring everybody you know, else in. Brian, he yeah. wants to have everything <laughs> yeah. theatrical. Uh, yes, and, and share with everyone. That's yeah. kind of the whole point. Okay, so all right, so here's the professor. You're on. Kerouac loved jazz so much you can hear the music in his prose. When I was younger, I loved the stories. Now it's not so much the story, I relish the language, it's his voice, his command of his instrument. I know the book so well now, I just pick up one and flip to any page and start listening to his music. But what about you? Why are you here? And I gave him the, the nickel sketch backstory, and then he goes, but why did you come halfway across the country to go to school on your summer vacation? Okay, let's see. Um, well, I love Kerouac's writing, like you said. I began holding out my finger to start to count the ways. Um, he writes about cool stuff. Um, he was so influential to so many major people, you know, from Lester Bangs to Jerry Garcia. And he's writing about real things that happened. Like, it's not some fictional story set in some imaginary town. For one thing, it's usually either in New York or San Francisco. So right there, that's cool. Or you're on the road, and that's a place I always want to be. But it was, he was there when everything was happening in New York. Abstract expressionism, method acting, bebop, and he was the writer. That whole era is so fascinating. I think it's the most exciting time in uh, American history, other than, I don't know, maybe San Francisco in the 60s. 
But New York in the 40s and 50s, man, that's when it was happening. I, <laughs> I live with Phyllis Condon, uh, the widow of Eddie Condon, the jazz band leader. And she's still totally with it. She knows more about what's going on in New York on a Saturday night than I do. And she talks about this cross-pollination a lot. How everybody hung out in the village. The musicians and actors and writers and comedians and painters. And they all drank like fish in a kettle. <laughs> And that was a magical time. The Jack was there for all of that. Rebel Without a Cause, The Wild One, and he was the writer's wing of the party. And it was a hell of a party. That's what I was saying about Kerouac being an entry to a whole other world, or a series of worlds. Yeah, and there's that whole music thing, and how that goes both ways. Like, on one hand, he's turned me on to Charlie Parker and Monk and all this stuff I don't know if I ever would have gotten around to. Then, you can see how, like, Springsteen or Dylan or Tom Waits or something are telling Jack stories about the same types of people. Like, Springsteen's The River that just came out. That's Jack. So, he isn't just turning me on to his music, he's turning me on to my music. That's really great. The door opens both ways. Yeah, and also, a Jack is so confessional. You're at the bottom of page eight of it. Just follow along as it goes. <laughs> yeah, and also Jack is so confessional. Maybe it's his Catholic thing, I don't know. But he's so honest, and it's like he's a friend writing you a long letter about Joan Anderson or Cherry Mary. And you sort of get adopted into the whole family. Mamere and Gerard and Nin and all that. But more Neil and Carolyn and Gabby and Johnny and Alan and Burroughs. It's like, I can't go to uh, and read books by Holden Caulfield's friends. Or Vonnegut's characters. But with Jack, just about every character has his own book out. Or a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's great. <laughs> and just then, this couple came walking along, who I think have got their cues set up about now. <laughs> I'd seen them around. She was a real chatterbox, also known as... <laughs> but always had this quiet, serious guy with her. And I... <laughs> And I said hi, and they came right over. Yes, we did. It was like this cool thing was already happening, where we were all at this kind of crazy summer camp together, with all these wayward spirits who were drawn like sprinkled iron shavings from across the continent by the magnetic pull of Jack. And since there wasn't that many, you're not reading this, sweetie. Um, and since there weren't other students around this abandoned campus in the middle of the summer, it was really easy to talk to people. Nobody here but us freaks. Bob, the professional inquirer, asked why they made the trip. And right away, she was jibber jabber jamber jewelin'. You know, I... I read a lot of writers. I'm a big reader. And Jack Kerouac, well, his road books, they have something I haven't found anywhere else. I love it. An opening. To people. Yes. A little more. <laughs> um, we're always supposed to care for the least among us, but nobody really does that, not even in fiction. But Kerouac, even when he got famous, he didn't start hanging out with Dick Cavett and all them, but would stay in the flop houses and spend time with street people, real people not phonies and posers. He was more like Jesus than all your God spells and Jesus Christ superstars put together. You listen to people. Yeah, that's what I get too. You know, they're real people, not some fictional Hemingway lion hunter or something. 
I'm taking ear training at NYU for music, but Kerouac is like ear training for voices. Wherever, I, whenever I read him, I get way more aware of the people around me. Like every person is a character. Everyone is interesting in their own way. He makes your whole day like a novel or a movie. Like everything's part of some grand story, and everybody you meet is in it. Me. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. He was open to everyone. He's always meeting new people. He seems like he'd be fun to go out with. Yeah, he was. I mean, just to hang with honey. Did she drag you along on this? Well, um, I'm getting my master's at Boston College in American Lit. And he paused, hoping somebody would say something else, but nobody did. I gave her on the road right after we met to see if we'd get along or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're the problem. Yeah. What was it that got you into the seal Carol? He asked, well, surgically yeah. cutting through the surface with his quizzical knife. <laughs> and just like that, Quiet Man opened right up. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> it's opening up. Well, there's all kinds of escapism. Romance novels, Heinlein, Harlan Ellison, Stephen King. But Kerouac was writing about actually escaping the same mundane existence that leads people to science fiction or pulp fiction or television. But Kerouac was writing about very real ways out. Like 50 ways to leave your lover. Yeah. Slip out the back, Jack. And we all caught the kismic name check and laughed. <laughs> no, but I think this is why he reaches so many people and for so long. It wasn't just one book or one way out. He had the road. Oh. This is the whole thesis. Which is one way, our, uh, our valid way out. Uh, out of town, a, a lousy relationship, a bad job. It's a direction, right? But th like if there's the Dharma bombs that points to the mountains, getting back to nature. You go for a hike, get away, and then there's the whole message through drinking and bar and hopping, the subterraneans. Or there's the everyman fantasy of jumping out on a ship in the open sea, vanity of doors. Or there's staying at home and escaping through your imagination and childhood memories, Dr. Sachs. Or everybody wants to sneak away to the cabin, to a cabin in the woods with their friends, Big Sur. He offered all these different routes that if a reader was at, was at all prone to his style, there was something that would speak to it. That's good. The professor said, quite seriously, academic to academic. I mean, he's so often portrayed as this one-trick pony, this on-the-road guy. Tell me about it. Right? But can, how can you lump visions of Gerard or scripture of the golden eternity in with the subterraneans or visions of Cody or Old Angel Midnight or the town of the city? If his name wasn't on the cover, you'd never believe they were written by the same person. So yeah, this guy's worth traveling across the country to get to know a little better and to actually meet the people he wrote about. That escape thing is totally right on. Like, I live in Manhattan, and even there the road is an option. Like, you hear people say the road isn't really there anymore, but I live in the densest populated part of the country, and about a minute after you cross the GW Bridge, you can hang a right on the Palisades Parkway, and this beautiful tree-covered road to the forest alongside these cliffs. I mean, from Greenwich Village, you can be on the road in a matter of minutes and pulling into some open road in the, uh, and pulling into a diner listening to total strangers from another world and order yourself some apple pie and ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> and just as they were laughing at my reference to Jack's favorite road food, the cassette in the deck uh, came to an end and loudly clicked off. And we all laughed some more at the synchronistic timing, and new class was over, and each of us returned to our regularly scheduled adventures. Thank you, Brian. What a crew. Thanks, everybody, for coming out to the Kettle of Fish. Uh, what a place. Come back to this place. We are literally subterranean. We are literally below the surface of the street. And the underground continues in New York City and all over the world. Thanks to everybody.
And now we resume our regularly scheduled drinking. Okay, I could I call you back in a little bit? Oh, okay, I don't know. See ya. Yeah. Alright, I'm gonna sing Brian's birthday song. It's a famous birthday song. It's not the birthday song we all know and love, but. Brian, here you go. Yeah. Congratulations. You made it this far. Congratulations on everything you are. When you think you know we're doing nothing to me, you're a shining star. Congratulations, you made it this far. There's more. <laughs> they say that sadness and pain makes you a little bit deeper. They say that love and kindness will lighten up your load. They say that every mistake you make makes you a little bit wiser. Congratulations, you made it this far. Now there are times when you give up, and there are times when you give in, and there are times when losing is the only way to win. And there are times when troubles come knocking at your door. But let me tell you, Brian, there's a whole lot more. There's a little bit of greatness in everyone you meet. And there's a little bit of fabulousness just walking down the street. And there's a world of wonder. You made it.